temples in India, not many, thankfully, um, but some, they, they believe in animal sacrifice and it's supposed to please the gods and how can that be? What I can tell you, and before I give you the answer, let me at least establish myself in, in being someone qualified to give you the answer. In the 22 years that I've lived in India, I have spent 22 years surrounded by the highest level religious leadership of this nation. Through my guru, Puja Swamiji, through all of the other revered saints with whom he is very, very close, who come here, where he goes there, I have had the opportunity to spend innumerable hours in the presence of the highest level religious leadership and to listen to them teach. But aside from that, we also are the organization that brought out the 11 volume Encyclopedia of Hinduism, which was a project that was well underway by the time I came in. Puja Swamiji had started it in the late 1980s. And it was about a 25 year project that involved about a thousand scholars from all over the world and was ultimately launched by His Holiness the Dalai Lama and the President of India and the Vice President of India and the Prime Minister of Great Britain, different, different events. But the, the first authentic, comprehensive encyclopedia of Hinduism. So, and I was blessed to be able to serve as managing editor of that. And I have actually read every single article. There were about 7,000 articles in it. And I actually read every single one of them. So with that as the base from which I'm going to tell you this, the, the teaching of animal sacrifice is a mis- translation, a misinterpretation of instructions given in the Vedas. Yes, it does talk about sacrifice. And yes, it does talk about animals. But it's not farm animals. It's the animal nature within yourself. When we perform the yagna ceremony, it's not about what you offer into the fire, whether it's rice and ghee, whether it's an animal. It's all about yourself. That which is supposed to be offered into the fire is the animal nature of yourself. That which we are told to offer to God because it is pleasing to God is the animal nature within ourself, which means the part of ourself that thinks I'm just this body. So I act like an animal, whether in how I eat, whether in how I procreate, whether in how I fight over territory, whether in all of that, the, the, the thing that separates humans from animals and the reason that a human birth is considered the highest level of evolution, which is ironic in some cases because actually if you pay attention to animals, it's really obvious that the vast majority of them live much more peaceful and dharmic lives than most humans. So it's, it's interesting when we really look at, well, why is it that humans are actually considered the pinnacle of evolution? Um, but the reason they are is very simple. We are the only species, we think, that has the capacity to look at itself that has the capacity to be conscious of itself. And only through looking at yourself are we able to experience enlightenment. Because only through looking at myself am I able to realize, ah, I'm not that. So there may be hunger in the body. There may be lust 
in the body. There may be fatigue in the body. There may be anger in the body. Because remember, the brain is part of the body. So the fact that there's, there's a pattern of chemical and electrical behavior that's taking place in certain parts of my brain with certain neurotransmitters that we can say, ah, arousal. It's physical. But me being able to look at that and say, ah, there is anger. There is hunger. There is fatigue. There is sex urge. There is greed. There is this, because all of these are taking place in my brain. And they're not taking place, you know, in the ether. It's taking place in me. And if you ever doubt that, if you ever doubt that it's chemical and electrical, take drugs. I mean, I'm not suggesting that you do. But the point is, what we know is that substances that you drink, that you swallow, change your emotions. This is why people become addicted to drugs. I'm angry, I'm upset, I'm restless, I'm frustrated, I drink this, I feel so much better. I swallow that, I feel so much better. So without going into the aspects of addiction, what we know is that which is going on in my brain is chemical and electrical. By introducing new chemicals that create new electrical patterns, I change how I feel. Okay, so that's physical. Now, if I'm simply acting out of it, stomach is hungry, I grab whatever's around me, I eat. Body wants to have sex, I grab whoever's around me, I have it. Body is thirsty, I grab whatever's around me, I drink it. Brain is angry, I grab whoever's around me and kill them. Whatever, whatever it may be. Or I punch a hole through the wall. These are simply stimulus response actions. This is how animals live. What humans have the ability to do is to look at that and to say, ah, anger. I'm going to take a few deep breaths. I'm going to sit here and meditate. I'm going to take a walk around the block. I'm going to introspect. Ah, hunger. OK, well. I'm hungry, except all that's in front of me is a plate of ladoos. I'm diabetic, not a good idea. Or I'm on a diet, not a good idea. I'll wait an hour till I get home and there's a proper meal. I can hold it. I know my stomach is growling. That's okay. I'll survive. Ah, sex urge. Okay, well, that person's not my wife. I'm not going to do it. It's wrong. I'm going to wait till I get home and see my wife. Or, oh, I've taken a vow of celibacy. OK, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to meditate. I'm going to rechannel that energy. So whatever the urge may be, the ability to look at it and not act on it is what makes us human. And so when we are offering to God the animal inside us, it's the, the forgetting of the fact that we're divine. It's offering to God the stimulus response aspect of me so that that which is divine in me can emerge. It's like what we were just talking about with Kamesh's question about the poison and the nectar. Well, so the poison is the ignorance that says you are this body, you are its urges, you are the thoughts, you are the emotions. The nectar is the awareness, ah, no, I'm not. I'm soul, I'm consciousness. I'm spirit, I'm love. I don't, I don't have to be a response to a chemical and electrical stimulus. And that's the nectar. 
And so in these temples, in the scriptures, what's, what's really told to us is offer that animal nature to God. That's what God wants. The word, the word yagna, the fire ceremony we do, literally the Sanskrit word, the, the meaning of it is sacrifice. That's where this whole misunderstanding came from, is all of the instructions of, you know, perform this yagna, perform yagnas, perform yagnas, perform yagnas. But it was never about take another life and destroy it. It was about purify the self. So that's, that's the truth of the sacrifice. And I, I pray and I, I really pray that eventually that, that teaching will spread more and more and more and more. Um, and even, even in the teachings of Tantra, for example, where they tend to, to use so many of the elements that the rest of spirituality tends to push aside, Again, it's for the teaching of recognizing that you're not the body. The ultimate goal is the same. But people lost the highest ultimate goal and got stuck in the means. And so the teaching there really is, well, all right, if you can't, if you can't, Offer your animal nature like that. All right, go through it. If your path is not going to be around it or above it or beyond it and you're someone who's going to have to go through it, no problem, let's go through it then. But still going through it with the vision that where I'm going is beyond it. Not that the point is to get stuck in it. So even there, that which we're sacrificing is myself. It's not going to do you any good on your spiritual journey to kill another being. I mean, there is, there is no, no parent I can think of who could possibly bestow blessings on their children for killing their other children. I mean, can you even imagine? So whether we say... God as the father, whether we say God as the mother, whether we say, you know, God as the creator, whatever it is, regardless of which aspect we think of, God is the creator, the parent, therefore, the one who has brought us into existence. And it is inconceivable to me that any parent could ever bestow blessings on a child for killing their siblings regardless of how dumb or low they may seem. I mean, can you, can you imagine a parent saying, oh yeah, you know, your brother who isn't quite as smart as you are, not quite as quick, or, you know, could even be a different species. Yeah, you know, kill him and offer him and I'll, I'll be very happy with you. Parents love their children regardless of how evolved or unevolved, how high or low, how smart or dumb the children may be. And so I cannot envision, and this is something that I've heard from, as I said, all of the saints, as well as from all the articles in the encyclopedia, is it's all about just the animal nature within you and that to the exact opposite of condoning animal sacrifice, Hinduism is a religion that reveres all of creation. You're not even allowed to pluck the leaf of a tulsi plant without praying to it. We don't pluck flowers in the night because they could be sleeping. Really. This is why, this is why we don't pluck flowers in the night, is because they sleep. So now you imagine the same saints and sages who are so worried that we should not disturb the sleep of the flowers 
are going to tell you to go out and hack animals to death? It doesn't make any sense. It's, it's a religion that is rooted in care for, reverence of, protection of all of creation, the human, the animal, the nature, the environment, the atmosphere, right? The Shanti Mantra, we are praying to the atmosphere. Yes, the animals, but not just the animals. All of the creation. So all of it has to be protected and, to pres and preserved. None of it slaughtered with the idea that it's somehow going to make God happy. Which is also why we're vegetarian. But that's a topic for another night.